My name is Lisa Gullo, and this is my starting over story. Growing up, my family went to church pretty regularly, and then when I was about nine years old, my mother all of a sudden decided she didn't believe in God, something bad had happened to her, and so I mean, we all stopped going to church, and honestly, it just made me more confused as I got older. Was God real? Is Jesus real? I just kept searching for different things. I mean, it wasn't, um, bad things necessarily, but I wanted a career, and I thought if I could move up the ladder and be the best I could be at my job, then I would be fulfilled. I wanted to get married, and when I got married, I thought that would be the answer. And then we decided to have children, and as lovely as they are, there was still something missing. In 2009, while I was at work, I suddenly passed out. After several days in the hospital, they determined that I have hemiplegic migraines which is your basic migraine with stroke-like symptoms. I was unable to work any longer, so as if the migraines weren't enough, I actually also started having seizures. It really set me back even more because I couldn't drive. You can't drive when you have seizures, so I was just stuck at home, mentally, physically, in every which way, and I just really believed everyone would be better off without having to deal with all of my issues. I attempted suicide by taking all my prescription medicine, which I had many of for various reasons. They intubated me in the hospital and I was unconscious for a week, but my throat swelled up so much they wanted to take the uh, intubation tube out to see if that would help. My throat was really swollen, I couldn't breathe. They shoved the tube back down and it damaged my vocal cords. So I cannot breathe through my nose or mouth. I can only breathe through the trach. The first thing I do remember is when I woke up, uh, they had put um, something on the trach here that allowed me to speak. But instead of speaking, I started saying, Jesus loves me. So the, the ICU nurse obviously heard me singing and she came over and asked if she could pray with me. And uh, she did that by the end of her praying. She asked if I would accept Jesus Christ, and I absolutely said yes. So as I continued to find my way back to God, I knew I wanted to get baptized. I don't know, I mean, for me, it just felt like the natural next step. I wanted to make that public proclamation that He is my Lord and Savior, and doing that was, for me, a continuation of my faith journey. The minute that I woke up in the hospital room, everything was different and I knew my life was gonna be totally different. I started over with everything, with how I treated other people, with how I felt about myself, even though I have these health issues, I just knew that moving forward, um, I had started a brand new life. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> it's a powerful story, and uh, I mean, for Lisa just to, to share that, to share um, just what she went through, to share the, her low point of her life, and uh, to share what God's doing in her life now, it's just, you know, I've been watching that, you know, every service, I'm just blown away uh, by that, um, but, but, but I'm also just constantly reminded of the reality that we're all experiencing her life in about three minutes. I mean, she told that story in about three minutes, but that was her life. That was, that was three weeks. That was three months. That was three years. In fact, she said it, it started back in 2009. So for nine years, this is, this is her life going into this spiral, getting into this place where nothing was fulfilling her, where nothing was seemingly going well, that her, her health was starting to decay and taken away from her to the point where she got to the so low a point in despair that she didn't want to live anymore. And that was a whole season that she went through before she got this starting over moment in her life. And then what I'm just aware of and thinking about just all of our services at all of our campuses is just how many of us are at one of those points in your life? 
How many of you are at a point where maybe you're discontent or a point where maybe you're in great despair or maybe at a point where, where you're hurting the most or maybe some of you are at a point where you've experienced a starting over point in your life? I don't know where you are in that story, but we know as pastors that we had to say something about this series because there's so many people who are struggling with this topic of regret. And so that's kind of where this series was birthed out of, was just like, how could we help people who, who can't get past their past, who are struggling with something in their life that's consuming them with this regret? And, and so that's what we've been talking about for the last two weeks. And if, if you missed any of these weeks, please go back online and watch these messages, because I believe there's something in there for each and every one of us. But all these weeks, what we've been talking about is this cycle that many of us get stuck in. And we've been calling it the sorry cycle, but basically it's a cycle where you, you experience a regret, and then what happens is because of that regret, then you go through this longing that that regret didn't happen, and then you, keep, you, you know, grieve the regret even more, and then you get stuck in this feedback loop that's just, it's just consuming you. And I think that's exactly what it is. It's like this, this feedback loop. That, and if I were to be honest, I think this is what causes a lot of anxiety in the lives of so many people. So many people come to me as, you know, as a pastor, I get to sit down with them, I'm talking with them, and they're just like, I just, I st- I'm just so anxious all the time, I just struggle with anxiety. And, and I don't know if you've ever tried to explain anxiety to someone. I don't know how you would verbalize it, maybe you would say, well, I just, it's an overwhelming feeling of just, of angst, or just, I'm always on edge. But, but I think what anxiety is, it's, it's just that, it's, it's your body gets caught in this feedback loop of shame or regret, and it builds up and builds up. And then that made me think like, like about physical feedback. I don't know if you've ever been in a service or a room like there. Maybe it's even happened here before where, where someone was on the stage speaking into a microphone, and, and, the, and the, they got too close to the speakers, and so there's feedback in the room. Right? Have you been in, the, in one of those settings, like maybe the county fair or something, and, 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 the, and the speakers start to reverberate, and then this loud pitch noise comes out, and overwhelmingly, it's, 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 it's comical a little bit for me, because I'm always the one on stage looking back at you when it happens, right? But when feedback happens, overwhelmingly, you don't even have to train someone, you know, like they, people know when feedback happens, the first thing they do, they go, whoosh, right? That, that microphone starts reverberating, and you're like, and here's what's interesting. Uh, what feedback is, it's when there's a, a microphone that, that someone's speaking into, and I speak into this microphone, and the sound comes out of a speaker. But if I get too close to the speaker, the sound coming out of the speaker reverts back into the microphone, which comes back out of the speaker, amplified again, which goes back into the thing, and comes out again. And that's why it gets so out of control like that. It's a, it's a loop. It's a feedback loop that gets out of control. And here's what's interesting to me. Though all of us cover our ears you do realize this does not stop feedback. The feedback is still happening. The feedback is getting worse and worse. This doesn't stop it. This may protect your ears for a moment. This may give you some comfort for a moment, but this is not solving the issue. To have feedback, feedback cease, the, the person at the microphone has to move away or the person at the sound table uh, has to bring the volume knob down. Like it, this doesn't stop anything. And I wonder how many of us, that's precisely how we're living our lives. We're stuck in this sorry cycle, this shame cycle, this anxiety in us, this building, we have this feedback loop in us that's reverberating, 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 and we're just, we're just going like this, throwing substances at it so that we don't have to feel it. But we're going like this, throwing you know, bad habits at it. Just like if I could distract myself doing something else, then I won't have to deal with my anxiety, with my struggle, with my shame. And I believe that, that, that God cares about that in you and God wants to resolve that in you and God wants to save us from that. And that when you open up the Bible, I think that God shows us the solution for this angst, the solution for this anxiety, the solution for the struggle that we have in us. And I believe it's in this text. And here's the thing, and I love this. There was a quote by Fred Rogers who said this. He said that life is simple and deep and we make it shallow and complicated. And I believe when you open up this Bible, the, the solution that God offers you and me, it's, it's simple, but it's deep. That from the very beginning of this text all the way to the end, that the Bible is truly an account of God really teaching us one huge lesson. And that one huge lesson can be summed up in one word even. And that lesson is forgiveness. Forgiveness. 
And I believe the power to get out of this cycle of anxiety, the power to get out of the cycle of shame or regret is for you and I to get better at forgiveness. In fact, I love the way the uh, Apostle Paul puts this. In Romans chapter 12, if you're taking notes, this is a great verse to, to write down. This is a great verse to memorize. Romans chapter 12, verse 18. It's very short, but it's deep and profound. It says this. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. I love that. Three simple truths but are still yet so deep, so profound. First, it starts off by saying, if it is possible. I don't know what you regret. I don't know if you regret something that you did. I don't know if you regret something that you didn't do. I don't know if you regret something that happened to you. But at some point, you have to learn to forgive. And I love that Paul's honest about it. Paul says, if it is possible. Because maybe for you, maybe, maybe forgiveness doesn't seem possible. Maybe that person has passed away or that person is out of your life and, and you don't have a, an avenue to speak with them anymore, to engage with them anymore, to, to, to ask for forgiveness. That, it doesn't seem possible to you. Or, or maybe something that happened to your past, it, it happened and it's impossible to change it. It's impossible to say that that thing didn't happen because it did. It's so maybe why you're stuck with your, with your regrets and your shame is because you don't feel like it's possible. Paul's going to give you different steps. Maybe if you can't talk to that person, maybe you need to still write those words on a page and get them out of your heart and, and onto a page so that you can let them be known. Maybe you need to address that, that thing that happened and you need to stop denying that it happened and, and, and know that it happened and, know, and call it what it was. It was evil and it was wrong and it should not have happened and it's, still, it's not happening now. And maybe you need to start telling yourself the truth and that. I don't know what it is, but if it seems like it's impossible, maybe there's some steps you need to take towards that. And then Paul says, as much as it depends on you. Because that's where forgiveness lies. I mean, you can forgive someone, but it doesn't mean that you can force them to be forgiven. You can't force them to accept your forgiveness, and, 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 and you can't f force them to maybe forgive you if you even ask for forgiveness. But as much as it depends on you, with a clear conscience, you can offer it. And I believe there's even freedom for you in that. And then Paul sums up, that last part says, live at peace, with everyone. And that's the result of that forgiveness, that you do get a peace in your life, a peace that goes beyond understanding, that you get to be outside of this feedback loop of anxiety and you get to start to experience life to the full. I believe absolutely that that's what God wants for all of us. I believe like that is the simple, the deep solution that God wants you and I to, to, to live in, to walk in, and, and to live out for our benefit. But for some reason, we don't do it. For some reason, we're, we're unwilling, many of us, to try it. And, and, and I can't only, I, for the longest time, I could not relate to what, how that must make God feel. Like, I, I could not understand, like, how, how that must make our God feel, looking at us, just trying to limp by when he's already given us a solution. And I didn't understand it until I had my second child. My second child, she is six years old. And I love her with all of my heart, Okay. But for some reason, she will not blow her nose. There is nothing more infuriating in this world than trying to teach a child how to blow their nose, okay? Some of you, your kids are grown, you've forgotten how miserable it is to teach a human being to blow their nose. Just blow, no, just, mm. just close your mouth and blow. No, it just, like, it's like, it's so hard. And I'm trying to get her to blow her nose and she just won't blow her nose. And I don't know how your cold season has been going, but mine's been glorious. Because I have a little snotty six-year-old who's walked around my house all day long. <laughs> my baby, blow your nose. I'm fine. You're not fine. Your snot coming out of your nose and back in your nose. It's not fine. It's no big deal for me. Just blow your nose for me. I don't want to listen to it. Here is a Kleenex, please, for daddy. Just, just blow. Just get that junk out of your face. You will feel better. I'm fine. <laughs> and I wonder, seriously, I wonder how many of, that, that is exactly what we're doing. God says, I want you to forgive. I want you to let it go. I want you to forgive that person. You're like, I'm fine. I don't, I don't need to forgive. I'm good. God's like, get that junk out of your face. You're going to feel so much better. But we don't. 
So many of us don't, and that's why we get caught up in the shame cycle. That's why we regret latches on so deeply to our heart. We are unwilling to forgive other people. Which makes me ask the question, why? And I think, it, I think the reasoning why is what Paul kind of understands, what Paul kind of lives out. In Acts chapter 24, Paul says this above, about himself. He says, so I strive always to keep my conscience clear before God and man. I think the reason that many of us are reluctant to forgive other people, I think the reason that many of us don't even have the ability to forgive other people is because we have never accepted forgiveness from God. That we have never accepted the forgiveness that God offers us. In fact, I would go so far to say this. I don't know how you would be able to forgive anyone else unless you could forgive yourself first. And for so many of us, the very thing that keeps us in our shame, the very thing that allows regret to take a hold of our heart is that we will not forgive ourselves. We won't do it. Why? If you were here last week, Kevin was here, and, and, and Kevin did a great job, and he talked to us about King David. Uh, king David, who was king of the nation of Israel. He's king of God's chosen people. And, 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 we, and if you were here, you saw that, uh, that Kevin talked about how David found himself in sin, that he committed adultery with Bathsheba, that he had her husband murdered, that, that David's life was in this, this downward spiral of shame where he was trying to cover up all of his sin. And eventually he, gets, he comes face to face with the prophet of God. And finally he confesses to God, I have sinned against the Lord. And when he confesses that to God, the prophet says the Lord has taken away your sin. That you've, the Lord has forgiven you. And again, that's so brief, Right? That's like a three-minute story that lasted over a season of David's life. In fact, I want to show you something. If you have a Bible with you or a Bible app, you can open it up to the book of Psalms. In fact, Psalm chapter 51 is what I want to look at together because Psalm chapter 51 was written by King David. And what I love about the book of Psalms, I don't know if you read the Bible a whole lot or not, but the book of Psalms is a very unique book of the Bible. It's right in the middle of the Bible. If you open up the Bible like halfway, you're probably gonna hit it. And what it is, it's a very unique section of scripture because pretty much all of the Bible before it and after it is God telling us about him, that he's our creator, that he's our deliverer, that he's our savior. And it's God letting us know who he is and what he will do. But in Psalms, what you see is these pages, these 150 books in here, 150 chapters in here, what you see, these are human beings, emotions. These are human beings telling God who we are. And that's why they're so wishy-washy. Like one of the Psalms could be like, God, you're so great and you're so close and I love you. And literally the very next Psalm is, where are you, God? Why have you forsaken me? They're emotional because we're emotional. And Psalm 51, this is David writing this psalm, and, and, and this is David, many people believe, him struggling with what he has done with Bathsheba, him struggling with what he's done against Uriah, him struggling with his own sin, his own guilt before God. And so he writes these words to God, and this is what he says. Verse one says, have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquities and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Look at this next verse. Against you and you alone have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. I read that, I'm like, against you and you alone? What about Uriah? What about Bathsheba? Like, but David realizes there's no hope in me asking for forgiveness from Uriah's family. There's no hope in me trying to make anything right with Bathsheba if I don't get this relationship right first. God, what I have done is outside of your will. God, what I have done is not just bad, it is against you. God, I am right now in front of you putting this out there. I have sinned against you. When is the last time you had a moment with that, like that, with God. When's the last time you were just honest? God, I have sinned against you, and you listed it out. 
This is what I've done. This is what I'm tempted by. This is what I do. This is what I'm you know, afraid I'm going to continue to do. David just, for verse after verse, just puts it out there about who he is, that, that he is sinful, that he is shameful, that he is wretched. He's owning it before God. And maybe that's what you need to do. Maybe the reason you can't get out of this shame cycle is because you're trying to pretend it's not there. David, in verse 10, he gets on the solution side of this, asking for God's forgiveness. And, and maybe if you don't know the words to ask of God, maybe you can make these words your prayer. But it says this, David says in verse 10, create in me a pure heart, O God. Renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. I love it goes on and even says, restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. David saying, God, will you forgive me? Will you do what you claim you will? And he risks asking for forgiveness. And again, like I said, the Bible is consistent all the way through that. That's who our God is. That's what our God does. Our God is a God of forgiveness. First John chapter 1, verse 9 says, if we confess our sins, he, talking about God, is faithful and just, and he will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. God will do that. Romans chapter 8, verse 1 says this, therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. What you see throughout the scriptures, what you see consistently is that there is a starting over moment guaranteed for each and every one of us. But the first step to accepting it is accepting forgiveness from God. And the first step to doing that is admitting your shame to God. But the solution is simple. And God says, if you will do that, I will forgive you. You just have to say it. And here's what's interesting to me. Though that is absolutely true, and God makes that way available to all of us, even in this room right now, many of us will not do it. We will not confess our sins to God. We will not ask for forgiveness. We will not take the solution. Why? Why? I've been reading a book uh, this past week. In this book, it's, it's talking about a study that has been done, and the study is specifically about people who live in the United States of America. And in this study, what it talks is about is why won't people in America take their pills? Overwhelmingly, people in the United States of America will not take their medicine. That a person will make an appointment with a doctor, they will go see a doctor, the doctor will prescribe medication for them, and a third of them will never fill the prescription. You went to the doctor. You went to the doctor and said, I don't feel well. The doctor says, oh, this will make you feel better. And we go, mm, quack, and we threw it away. <laughs> a third of you won't take medication. Of the two-thirds who will fill the, the prescription, half of those won't take the pills correctly, and they won't take them to their completion. Why don't you take your pills? And, and, and this is not just like for just little things. This is not just pills for colds. Like this is also for major things. Imagine, imagine going through organ failure. Imagine for years your kidneys are shutting down. Imagine they completely shut down. Now you have to go and you have to get dialysis. You have to go to a place and have all the blood drawn out of your body, cleansed, put back inside. You do that several times a week. You do that for years, waiting for a match for your kidneys. And finally you get a, a, a match and then you go through the surgery and you get this new organ put in your body that functions and it's there and you have a new lease on life that is yours for the taking and all you gotta do is keep taking your anti-rejection pill and there's accounts where people don't take their pills why would you do that the author suggests the reason is shame 
The reason is that human beings, by and large, have the unique position that we know ourselves to be unworthy. We know ourselves to be unworthy of health, to be unworthy of life, and we sabotage ourselves. Scripture talks about that in Genesis chapter 3. In Genesis chapter 3, it says that sin enters this world. Sin enters this world and gives humanity, you and I, the knowledge of good and evil. And the truth about having the knowledge of good and evil is not to be able to point out what is good or what is evil, but it's also to be able to know with certainty that you are not good, that you are evil. And we know that to be true of ourselves and we know what our motives are and we know the things that we think about other people. We know the harm that we've intended to other people. We know our shortcomings, our flaws. And so we disqualify ourselves from anything good and we wanna punish ourselves because we feel like that's what we deserve because we know ourselves to be wretched. It's a unique position of humanity. And so we don't believe we're worth the cure and we disqualify ourselves. Now, what's staggering is similar study has the exact opposite results when the medicine that's prescribed is for your dog. In the United States of America, when you take your dog to a vet and your vet prescribes medication for your dog, overwhelmingly, we get those scripts filled. Here's hundreds of dollars to get my puppy pills. And you bring them home, and you're like, oh, you're going to take your pills. And we take the pills, and we wrap them up in some meat. You go, here's your pill, here's your pill. And then they spit it out, we pick it up, and like, swallow, swallow, swallow. And we will do that dance every single day until that bottle is completely empty because we love our dogs. <laughs> because our dogs are pure. Our dogs are innocent. Our dogs love us. We want them to live longer. All the while, the dog's like, yeah, but you're going to die, and no one's going to feed me. So if you could take your pill, <laughs> too, that would help all of us out. God knows who you are. God knows exactly who you are. And God has given you the pill. He's giving you the solution. He's given you the way to have life and life to the full. He's given you the way to be forgiven. You are the only thing keeping you between experiencing that kind of freedom. Paul puts it this way in Ephesians chapter four. It says this, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ, God forgave you. And what I love is the tense of that word. God forgave you. It's past tense. It's already done. It already happened. God forgave you. It's time for you to forgive yourself. And when we do that, then out of the overflow of that, we will have the strength to forgive others. And then we can truly get past this regret and start living this starting over kind of life.